when you have it. These words are hard, so I want you to be clear. I am not making this up. This is Jesus speaking. Amen? All right. Concerning anger. Now, I want you to know again, those of you who were present last Sunday heard me say that this teaching from Jesus follows the Sermon on the Mount, follows the time in which Jesus began to turn upside down people's conceptions of what was right and what was wrong, what was strong and what was weak. The Sermon on the Mount is where Jesus literally is teaching people that those who are weak will be those who are strong. Those who are mourning will be those who are comforted. Those who are poor will be those who are rich. Keep in mind, Jesus is turning it upside down. He continues with the topic of anger. Turn to your neighbor and say, it scares me when Jesus talks about anger. (laughs) It should scare you when Jesus talks about anger. It makes me have a lot of work to do. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, You will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go first be reconciled. Don't come to the altar first, Jesus says. Go first, be reconciled. Go first, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly. Jesus is encouraging us to move through our anger quickly. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison, and truly I will tell you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. We read that last week. Say amen if you heard it last week. It's worth hearing again. Jesus goes on. You've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone that looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is speaking to a patriarchal society, but the same applies for us women. Every woman who looks at a man with lust in her heart your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown in hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, Jesus says, that anyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of unchastity causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more comes from the evil one. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second. Give to everyone who begs from you. 
And do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I want you to raise your hand if you are uncomfortable with this text from Matthew or if you have at least one question for Jesus after hearing this text. Go ahead. I I would expect everybody does. Something in this should make you uncomfortable. Amen? This is Jesus really challenging the community, and I want to use this to unpack what it means to follow after Christ. We just sang, Jesus at the center of my life. Jesus at the center of this church. Jesus at the center of everything. But before we can put Jesus at the center, we need to know who he is. Because how could he ever redefine who we are if we don't even know what he says. Raise your hand if you've ever heard the fullness of that text read together. Powerful text. Let us pray. God, you're confusing, you're challenging, and you always have a word that transforms me. I thank you for the way, God, that you don't want us to stay where we are, that you never accept the game by the rules that the world creates, that you always push us deeper. God, I ask this morning that the power of your Holy Spirit would intercede and that the words that I speak would be what you have for us, not my thoughts or opinions, but your desire. I ask God beyond anything that your Holy Spirit would penetrate hearts. And that we would be drawn closer to you, you at the center of who we are. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to come down a little bit closer because for whatever reason I can't preach this sermon from up there. I told someone this morning that last night I felt like Jacob wrestling with the angel. I swear I slept two hours last night. I wrestled all night. Because I could not possibly come to the place to preach about anger for the second Sunday. I thought last Sunday was hard and this Sunday was going to be easy. Wrong. It just got harder. Given the current context of our world, given the way in which the conversation is becoming polarized, given the way in which we are struggling to remember who God calls us to be, but I couldn't stand here. And preach on Matthew 5 without engaging the realities that are around us. So I may say something today that makes you angry. Touch your neighbor and say, she might make me mad. Touch your neighbor and say, she might make me mad. Touch your other neighbor and say, I'm going to be patient and listen for God. That's the most important one. I'm going to be patient and listen for God. I want to start with a commercial that is just coming out from Procter & Gamble, a commercial that's called The Talk. Raise your hand if you've seen this commercial. It's called The Talk. Musu's seen it. In this commercial from Procter & Gamble, there are three scenes. In each of these scenes, there is a mother, a woman of color, an African-American woman speaking to her children. In the first scene, there is a young girl, perhaps six. She and her mother are in their bedroom. The mother is doing her daughter's hair. They're looking both into the mirror as the mother is doing her hair and the mother is talking. She says to her little girl in front of her, that was not a compliment. And the little girl stares back at her mother in the mirror. They have apparently just come from the grocery store where they had a conversation with a woman in line. The mother repeats again to the six-year-old girl, that was not a compliment. You are pretty, period. Turn to your neighbor and say, period. You are pretty, period. You are not pretty for a black girl. You are pretty, period. And like a woman forming the life of her young child, conscious of the injustice that her child will face. Her eyes well with tears, and she looks straight into that mirror, into her daughter's eyes, and says, don't 
you ever forget it. The commercial moves to a second scene. In this scene, there is a mother sitting at a table with her young teenage son. Raise your hand if you are a mother who has had a young teenage son and he has not wanted to listen to a thing you had to say. Raise your hand. All of the, I, don't, I only have preteen sons and this is already happening. In this, in this instance, the mother is sitting at this table in what looks like an apartment and this young man is so ready to leave to get to basketball practice that he hardly has time to listen to his mother, but she is not playing. She makes him stop. She looks him dead in the eye and she says, do you have your ID? Yes, he says. She looks right back at him. You come home immediately after practice. You come home immediately after practice. The commercial moves to a scene that one understands to be hours later, and you see the image of this young boy, 15 years old, probably a backpack on, his sweatshirt on, walking through what looks like the city street. And his mama's at the kitchen table where he left her praying for his safe return. The third scene is what I would assume to be a 16-year-old girl, African-American, proud to be in the driver's seat of her family's SUV. One could assume that this family is upper middle class given the home that they are parked in front of. For whatever reason, the mother in this story is the one that has been tasked to teach her daughter how to drive. Now, let me tell you a brief story about me driving. So my mama taught me to drive. I don't know why. One would think my dad, with all of his patience, would be better suited, but maybe he was smarter. So when I was learning to drive, it made no sense to me that on a green light, you couldn't turn left. Because to me, green means go. I, fr I didn't understand this yield to oncoming traffic. So my mother is in the passenger seat. I am driving, and we're about to go through an intersection, and the light turns green, and I turn left, and she screams. My mother never screamed. What are you doing? It's green. My mother was tasked with teaching me how to drive. In this commercial, the mother is teaching her 16-year-old daughter, and clearly they have just returned from a lesson. And the daughter is about to go out for the first time on her own. Her mama's hand is on the door, and the mother won't leave until she asks one more question. She looks right at her daughter and says, what will you do if an officer stops you? The girl gets quiet and chides her mother, Mom, I'm a good driver. The mother doesn't move her hand. Her voice is stable again. She looks right back at her daughter, and she says, What will you do if an officer stops you? The daughter says, Mom, I won't get stopped. And the mother said, This is not about your driving. This is about whether you come home tonight. And the commercial goes dark with the words, the talk. Do we really pay attention to the ways in which people of color have to speak to their children? The ways in which there is a different dialogue that must go on? The ways in which the subtext of what is taught is that there is injustice. As I prepared to preach today, I couldn't help but see the outrage to this commercial. Person after person insinuating that the commercial itself, instead of describing a reality that exists in our nation, is ripping us apart. What if it's just the truth? What if it's just describing where we are? What if it is an invitation to become something different? This week, after the events in Charlottesville on Saturday, after the discourse from our public leadership,
After yet another neo-Nazi white supremacist rally in Boston, the issue and the conversation around race, white supremacy, and violence is present. Raise your hand if you have at some point in time been asked to comment or engage in some kind of discourse. Raise your hand. It's hard not to. And so the question is, as people of faith wrestling with the issue of anger and what Jesus himself teaches us, I ask you, what's your response? What is the response that Jesus Christ calls for? Now, many of you probably know that we cannot open our Bibles to a specific chapter where Jesus teaches on racism. You can't do that about several of the topics that are relevant to contemporary discourse, but we are invited to know him enough to love him and understand Christ's heart so that we might understand his witness in a context like today. In addition to the commercial that I shared with you, there was a conversation in Facebook begun by Reverend Asa Lee. Some of you may actually know Reverend Lee. He is the son-in-law to Bishop Innes of Liberia. He's married to Bishop Innes's daughter, who is a pastor. And he is a dean at Wesley Theological Center. He says, some people feel this nation is being ripped apart. For others of us, he says, it's actually the reality of the hypocrisy being exposed. I'll say that one more time. Some feel that this nation is being ripped apart. For others of us, it's actually the reality of the hypocrisy being exposed. I want to stop for a minute and allow you to consider all that I've said. Remember I said at the beginning, I might make you angry. Touch your neighbor and say she might make me mad. I want you to consider what it is that you and I are called to do to respond to what Reverend Tim Warner and I and those who participated in the book study put together by sojourners refer to as America's original sin. Racism. What if the very foundation of this country had built into it racial discrimination against African Americans, against Native Americans, against Latin Americans, against Asian Americans? What if that were really true? And what if in that truth we have an invitation to respond because the reality is we start to process through that and all of our emotions churn. Raise your hand if your emotions are a little bit uh, moving in your stomach right now. It's what happens. And we get afraid and we turn off the conversation and we begin to walk away from the very invitation that Jesus extends. I watch the discourse in this country, and I watch people say, I'm not racist, I'm not white supremacist, I would never do that. And I think of Jesus' teaching at the Sermon on the Mount when he says, it's not about whether you murder, it's about whether you've been angry with someone. It's not about whether you were engaged in an adulterous affair with someone. It's about whether you looked at another person with lust in your heart. It's not about whether you have divorced. In fact, Jesus is speaking to a very specific historical context in which men use divorce as a way to go through women like cards. Jesus says, no, no, no. You don't have to just give them a certificate. You actually have to have a legitimate reason to break this relationship. And he says, there are reasons for divorce. But don't use this for your own purposes. What if Jesus is inviting us to go deeper than just the justification that pushes us away from the problem and inviting us to look at our hearts? Because if you or I are listening and we have never been angry, never lusted, or never used or manipulated another person, we are not being honest with ourselves. 
every single one of us has something to hear from what Jesus is saying. Jesus talks specifically about not the outward act, but about what needs to change within each one of us. I want to do a demonstration on anger. I did this for youth Bible study, and it stuck with me for two weeks. I'm going to share it with you. And I invite you to consider as we do this, the first words of the James text, which says, you must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. When we look at anger, I want us to start with milk. If you're a baby, you probably drank milk from your mother's breast or formula at your mother or father's hand. Milk. Milk is something that we need to grow. It's good for the bones. It's good for uh, our growth. But if you leave it sitting around for even a short period of time, it gets nasty. And the longer you leave it out, Wade says it has the potential to become cottage cheese. The first ingredient in our anger when we don't deal with something and it starts to turn things sour. What if we really dealt with the reality of racism as Christians? And then had the ability to move forward. Maybe it just bothers us a little bit, but it bothers us enough that if we don't deal with it, it turns sour. If something causes us to be angry and we just ignore it and leave it there, it's like the milk sitting on the counter instead of putting it where it belongs. I'm guilty of that in my house. I'm the one who leaves the milk on the counter. Ignoring the milk on the counter doesn't help. And ignoring your anger doesn't help. The second ingredient in this anger soup that we're making is hot sauce. Somebody said, you wasted hot sauce, Pastor Jen. Forget about the organic milk from Whole Foods that my husband has bought. Second ingredient in anger soup is hot sauce. You can't see totally, but our anger starts to change the character, the color of who we are. We don't want anyone to see, but the milk's turned sour, and the inside of our life is becoming changed by what we hold in. The third step in our anger is sugar. Now, sugar is interesting. We use sugar to sweeten, to cover over things that are not good. Raise your hand if you've ever tried to sweeten over anger you haven't dealt with. Sugar coating anger. Only three people in this congregation have ever sugar-coated anger. Come on now. Christians, we think this is what it means to be peaceful. We think it just means we live with anger and we just pour sugar on top. Sugar. To sweeten away the anger, the thing about sugar is that when it dissolves, or like corn syrup, it is this un invisible ingredient that ultimately rots our teeth and can eat away the lining of our stomach if it stays in there. And the final ingredient in anger is supposed to be sardines. You can thank my husband, Edgar, who eats these. God only knows why. I'm not opening those in church. We're going to use vinegar instead. The fourth step in vinegar in anger soup is when our anger is sour and invisible and insidious enough that it starts to stink. And it affects everything about who we are. Anger can be given by God for very righteous purposes to identify injustice and danger around us. But when we sit with it, when we refuse to work through it, when we pour sugar on top and don't deal with it, it becomes toxic in the very fabric of who we are. We sing Jesus at the center. What if we put Jesus at the center? 
and believed that Christ's love for us and our love for him and for each other was strong enough to begin the process of repentance and reconciliation required as we move through racism? What if we actually believed that instead of ignoring it or hiding it or being afraid of it or talking about it in corners, that Christ was big enough for the church to deal with sin? What's the first step in dealing with sin? It's the first thing we do when we're confronted with our sin. Besides the impulse to run away and hide and blame somebody else. After that, then what do we do? What? We ask for forgiveness and we repent. We turn the other way. What if we began to change? What if we began to change how we interacted? Epworth is such a unique community right now. Where else do you find people of African, African American, Latin American, white, Asian American community together? But it doesn't matter if we sit in the pews and are afraid to talk about the realities that shape our life and the power of the king to make us free. We need to be the people that Christ is in changing the discourse that exists. Racism is real. White supremacy is native to this country. But we as people who love Jesus Christ can move beyond our fear and our anger to stand together against the injustice that is around us. I want to close by reading a quote from one of the pastors in this conference that I most respect. Reverend Joe Daniels is a former district superintendent and a current pastor of Emory Fellowship. And he says, the gospel writer informs us that a house divided against itself cannot stand. A house divided against itself cannot stand. That's why Jesus must be the center. Wise leaders from government to the church, from community groups to families, take the necessary steps to save the house and heal the house when the cracks start revealing themselves. And when a chasm emerges, wise leaders elected, appointed, anointed, and positioned. That means you can fall in any one of those categories. Wise leaders move Act, speak up, stand up, stand in, and save the house through spiritual, moral, ethic, legal, and righteous means. America is a house facing a growing chasm that is perpetuated by its top leader, and we need leaders to stand in the gap. It's time for wise leaders, for Christians who embrace their calling to help, heal, save, and take action lest the house no longer stand. Our children are watching. Wouldn't it be a beautiful day when instead of having to have the talk, we could spend the time speaking about how Jesus teaches us to move through anger. We will never make a movement, build a church, or be the body of Christ fueled by our anger. It will only be love. Because even when anger starts out as righteous, it usually happens. What usually happens even when anger starts out as righteous? Our own ego gets involved. Our feelings get hurt. We get more afraid Somebody we love gets hurt. And all of a sudden, we have lost the ability. Jesus says, if you're angry, you can't come to my altar. Not because he doesn't want us. He's the only one who can take that nasty soup and make it something else. He says, you can't worship me. If you're so angry with each other, your hearts are closed. Open our hearts Embrace the realities around us and work for justice. Because by the power and the grace of Jesus Christ, 
He has told us who we are. Amen. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be. Cheers.